Get the unmissable news stories of the day. This is the Beijing Hour. Examining the events that impact and shape China and the rest of the world. This is the Beijing Hour, one hour of news and information brought to you every weekday. Now here's your host. Shane Begum with you on this Monday, August 26, 2024. You're listening to the Beijing Hour, coming to you live from the Chinese capital. On today's program, Hamas says it's rejected new Israeli conditions in the latest Gaza ceasefire talks. Leaders from 18 Pacific Island nations are gathering in Tonga for the annual meeting of the Pacific Islands Forum. And rescue efforts are underway in flood-affected regions in northeast China after the latest heavy rainfall. In business, China opposes a U.S. decision on export controls. In sports, Chinese swimmer Sun Young takes gold upon his return to the pool. In culture and entertainment, China's summer box office has raked in 11 billion yuan so far. Now checking the day's top stories. Hamas says it's rejected new Israeli conditions put forward in Gaza ceasefire talks. Hamas on Sunday urged Israel to abide by July's ceasefire proposal, which included a permanent ceasefire and Israel's complete withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. Uh, these were among the terms stated in the U.N. Security Council resolution and a speech by U.S. President Joe Biden. Hamas negotiators left Cairo after meeting mediators from Egypt and Qatar. Yasser Hakim has more from Cairo. Just a reminder of what are the sticking points that have been prolonging the talks. First of all is obviously what are the name of the prisoners who will be through the prisoner swap? What will happen after the ceasefire? Will Israel actually withdraw from Gaza as Hamas has been uh, demanding? And as Hamas says, it has been agreed upon in July 2nd agreement, that proposal that was submitted by the U.S. Obviously, one sticking point which involves Egypt as well is the Rafah border crossing, the corridor known as the Philadelphia corridor along the border between Gaza and Egypt. According to the peace treaty signed between Egypt and Israel in 1979, this area should be monitored and operated by Egypt and Palestine. Uh, Israel took over control of this area a couple of weeks ago and has. And Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel said that he intends to stay there. Egypt has refused. Hamas is refusing as well. And the Israeli team that has been in Egypt has come up with a new map that shows some kind of reduction of the, of the uh, Israeli forces on the corridor and maybe even a change in their positions. However, uh, what you understand from the Egyptian statements and the, and the Hamas statements is that they are calling for a complete withdrawal of Israeli forces from the Rafah border crossing and from the Philly uh, corridor to allow for the reopening of the border crossing for aid. That was Yasser Hakim reporting. Palestinian news reports say at least five Palestinians are dead after Israeli, uh, Israeli airstrikes in Gaza City. Gaza-based health authorities reported that Palestinian deaths from Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip had surpassed 40,400. Akram al-Satari has more from Han Yunus. People in Gaza are still living that atmosphere of fear and continuous bombardment and devastation. Right behind us, right in front of us, Nasser Hospital has been receiving bodies of the people who were killed in different parts of the Gaza Strip. While we have been hearing other news about Al-Aqsa Hospital that has been under imminent threat of the Israeli ground operation taking place in Gaza Central area. The hospital has been receiving also the bodies of the people who were targeted and killed in different operations throughout the day. Around 19 Palestinians were killed. The bodies of 13 of them were received in Nasser Hospital while dozens others were injured. The bombardment can be heard in Khan Yunis and Deir al-Balah and also from Rafah area where people cannot go there to retrieve the bodies of their dear. And also the news for coming from Gaza area, Az Zaytun area and also Al Shaja'iya, Beit Hanun and Beit Lahia are indicative of continuous aerial strikes and artillery fire that has been destroying the houses and also causing death and injury among the Palestinians. One of the most fresh news about the situation is the new evacuation order that was made to one more block in Deir al balah area in Gaza Central area where the citizens in that area were asked to move to eastern Deir al balah area by the beach area. More Palestinians are targeted, killed and injured even in those prescribed as humanitarian zones. That was Akram al Satari reporting. Health authorities in Gaza say nearly 1.3 million doses of polio vaccine have arrived in the enclave home to over 2 million people. 
And preparations are underway to launch the vaccination campaign supported by the UN, which targets 640,000 children in Gaza. Each child from birth to 10 years old will receive two doses of vaccine. The Ramallah-based Palestinian Health Ministry is working with international partners to launch the campaign in the coming days. Hamas has agreed to the UN's call for a truce to enable the vaccination effort. Last week, the UN said a 10-month-old baby suffered partial paralysis after contracting polio in Gaza, the first such case in the territory in 25 years. Thousands of protesters in Israel have stepped up demands on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to secure a deal for the release of the remaining hostages in Gaza. Rallies took place in Tel Aviv and other Israeli cities over the weekend. I think that the war has to end for both the Palestinian and the Israelis. And I think that the hostage deal is something that we must go uh, and to promote as soon as possible. I feel that this is the most important thing for us to save the people that are still alive. This is what we are fighting for. This is the most important thing for every Israeli. First of all, to save the lives of the people and to try and stop this horrible war. It has to have an end and we need to live together. Hamas said that it's holding around 110 hostages, but Israel believes around a third of them are dead. Israel claims that Hezbollah's missile barrages failed to hit any of its military bases. Israel says it's destroyed thousands of Hezbollah rocket launchers and thwarted a major attack. Jonathan Regev has more from Tel Aviv. As uh, the hours go by uh, after uh, the uh, crossfire, the heavy crossfire between Israel and Hezbollah in the early hours of uh, Sunday morning, it seems as if we can cautiously say that uh, this phase is now over. It also seems as if both sides are now trying to dictate their narrative. Both sides are trying to say that they achieved success. If you listen uh, to Israel, then the Israeli message from uh, the early hours of the morning was that uh, Israel has has uh, been able to thwart all of uh, the rockets that were uh, meant to be fired towards central Israel, uh, also uh, destroying all of uh, the uh, rocket launchers that were aimed at uh, doing so. Israel also claiming that it uh, it did not enable uh, Hezbollah to fire most of uh, the rockets that it planned to do to northern Israel. But if you listen to Hassan Nasrallah, the Hezbollah chief, his messages are exactly the opposite. Nasrallah saying that Hezbollah was able to fire as far as a central Central Israel was able to even hit some strategic locations, a very important intelligence base located just to the north of Tel Aviv, an important Air Force base which is located uh, further uh, to the north. So uh, the uh, sides, Israel and Hezbollah, dictating uh, their uh, narrative and both sides seem to be uh, sending messages uh, to each other, of course not directly, but through a third side saying uh, that they do not wish this uh, conflict uh, to escalate and therefore we can cautiously say that this phase is uh, now over and now the crossfire will return to be what it was for the past uh, 10 and a half uh, months, mostly concentrated on the uh, border itself. That is, of course, until the next time. That was Jonathan Regev reporting. Uh, Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah says Sunday's attack against Israel targeted an Israeli military intelligence base close to Tel Aviv. Nasrallah also said the attacks being delayed to give the Gaza ceasefire talks a chance. Hezbollah called this attack an initial response to the killing of one of its commanders in an Israeli airstrike in Beirut last month. Nasrallah said Israel's strikes on Sunday morning did not impact the response. It was an aggression, not a preemptive act. If we assume that it was a preemptive act, then it had no impact at all on our military operations today, neither on its missiles, nor on its drones, nor on its fighters. Hezbollah claimed two hidden Israeli military intelligence site near Tel Aviv, and Israel claimed its strike had been preemptive to avert a larger attack. Neither side has offered evidence. Uh, Zara Alderzi reports from Beirut.
In a televised speech on Sunday, Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah announced the end of Operation Arbaeen, a major military operation against Israeli sites linked to the assassination of top military commander Fuad Shukr in Beirut last month. Nasrallah said the main targets attacked were Israeli military bases and barracks in Galilot near Tel Aviv and Ain Shimmer airfield. Nasrallah said they would be satisfied with the operation if they were satisfied with their results. Otherwise, they reserved the right to respond and called on the Lebanese people to return to their lives and homes. We will follow up as a result of the secrecy of what happened in these two bases, especially in Galilot. We will follow up on our sources and the information that we will obtain if the result is satisfactory and achieves the intended goal. We consider the response to the assassination of Mr. Commander Haj Mosin and the targeting of the suburb to be completed. And if the result is not sufficient in our eyes, we currently reserve for ourselves the right to respond until another time. According to Nasrallah, the delay in the military operation aimed to resume negotiations in light of the breakdown of the talks in Doha and Cairo. The retaliatory response on Sunday took place in two phases, beginning with the launch of about 340 Katyusha rockets and multiple drones to occupy air defenses. Nasrallah denied Israeli claims of a preemptive strike to thwart Hezbollah attacks, saying that what they planned happened. Despite the recent escalation between Hezbollah and Israel, international mediators are working non-stop to prevent a wider conflict in the region. And many believe a diplomatic solution can still be achieved, but if more time passes by, the greater the chances of further escalations that could lead to mistakes and accidents. That was Zara al reporting. Residents of the Israeli-controlled Golan Heights have expressed concerns over rising tensions between Israel and Lebanon. Both sides have halted the heavy exchange of fire, but Golan residents say they now fear a repeat of the tragedy of July 27th when 12 children died in a strike in the area. <laughs> We don't need this to happen again to us and our children, nor anyone else. Those kids are ours. We hope this will never happen again. We're still living under stress and still it's increasing with everything which is very unsettled. I hope for the war to end and there to be peace. We don't wait for speeches from Hassan Nasrallah or Netanyahu. We hope from both sides to get a peace deal and for people live in peace. The exchange of fire came as Egypt hosted high-level talks to secure a ceasefire in Gaza. Hezbollah began attacking Israel almost immediately after the start of the Gaza conflict. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Charles Brown have discussed ongoing developments in the Middle East uh, and escalating tensions along the Israel-Lebanon border. Uh, The president stressed the need for decisive international action to defuse tensions and highlighted the importance of joint Egyptian-U.S.-Qatari efforts to secure an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The U.S. general expressed appreciation for Egypt's role in supporting regional stability and looked forward to expanding military cooperation to enhance mutual interests and reinforce peace in the Middle East. Meanwhile, Israeli and Hezbollah forces exchanged fire along the border, and Hezbollah claimed to have launched hundreds of missiles into Israel in retaliation for the killing of a commander. In response, Israel conducted preemptive strikes on Hezbollah rocket launchers in southern Lebanon. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad says improving relations with Turkey requires mutual respect for sovereignty and a true commitment to addressing the root causes of their tensions. Addressing the Syrian People's Assembly, Assad said Turkey must withdraw its forces from Syrian territory and cease support for groups that Syria sees as terrorists. What Turkish officials continuously declare is related to the issue of refugees and terrorism, while what Syria consistently declares is related to the withdrawal from Syrian territories and also the issue of terrorism.
Assad awesome. emphasized uh, that there are these are not mere conditions, but fundamental requirements for successful diplomacy. And he called for a formal agreement to guide future negotiations in line with international law and stressed Syria's commitment to uh, defending its sovereignty and nat- uh, national interests amid global tensions. Syria and Turkey cut diplomatic ties in 2011 with little progress made despite recent mediation efforts by Russia, Iran and Iraq. UN Special Envoy for Libya has highlighted the importance of the 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission in maintaining the ceasefire in Libya. Uh, Stephanie Khoury was speaking during a visit to CERT around 450 kilometers east of Tripoli. Khoury stressed the need to uphold the 2020 UN-sponsored ceasefire agreement, which ended conflict between rival factions in the country. The 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commissions, uh, a group composed of representatives from the Tripoli-based Government of National Unity and the Eastern-based National Army. It oversees and implements ceasefire agreements and military uh, arrangements between rival factions, in Libya. The country remains politically divided since the fall of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. Coming up, the annual meeting of the Pacific Islands Forum. Dive into news like never before with Deep Dive, the podcast from CGTN Radio. Join our global reporters for captivating stories and thought-provoking conversations. Search Deep Dive on your favorite podcast platforms and get ready to dive in. We're at 16 past the hour. Leaders of Pacific Island nations are gathering in Tonga for their annual meeting. The Prime Minister of Tonga chairs the five-day Pacific Islands Forum, which kicks off on Monday. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres praises the 18 member states for their efforts to protect the seas and combat climate change. Pacific Islands Forum is guided by the long-term 2050 strategy to ensure the health and well-being of the people. And with more, Pandung spoke to China's special envoy for Pacific Island Countries Affairs, Chan Bo. It has two mechanisms in place, the Pacific Islands Forum and the Pacific Islands Development Forum. Has China engaged in any form of communication and cooperation under the two? And how will the two sides work together under multilateral frameworks. Pacific Island Forum is an important intergovernmental international organization in Pacific Island region. China has become the first batch of dialogue partners with PIF since 1989. For more than 30 years, the relation between China and the Forum has maintained steady development. China has sent government delegations to attend the dialogue meeting of PIF for several decades. And the economic, trade and investment cooperation between the two sides has also achieved good results. Since the establishment of Pacific Island Development Forum, it has been playing a positive role in promoting coordination, cooperation and development in the Pacific Island region. As a founding development partner of PIDF. China pays high attention to the importance of PIDF in the region and has sent delegations to attend related meetings for many times. We are willing to strengthen communication and cooperation with the forum and contributing together to the development and prosperity of the island region. In recent years, China has established seven platforms of multilateral cooperation with Pacific Island countries on emergency supplies, climate change, poverty reduction, agriculture cooperation, disaster prevention, Qingtao technology, and police training, helping Pacific Island countries to develop economy and improve livelihood through mutually beneficial cooperation. The cooperation between China and the Pacific Island countries is two-wheel driving, which goes well in both bilaterally and multilateral channels. In the future, China will remain committed to expanding exchanges and cooperation in all aspects with Pacific Island countries, delivering more outcomes that benefit the people and pushing the comprehensive strategic partnership between China and the Pacific Island countries for greater development from a new start. That was China's special envoy for Pacific Island Countries Affairs, Qianbo, talking about cooperation between the two sides. 
Nauruan President David Adeyang says his country sees great promise in partnering with China. During an interview with Li Dongning, the president also said Nauru would like to stand on the right side of history by recognizing the One China Principle. Well, in January this year, China and Nauru resumed uh, diplomatic ties, uh, which made Nauru the 183rd country to have diplomatic relations with China. So what does that mean to Nauru's development? We see great uh, promise in partnering with China, given its uh, major strides in development brought about by China's uh, modernization, uh, particularly through the initiatives of the Belt and Road Initiative and the Global Development Initiative, and how we may align those with our own national development strategy. Well, one China principle is uh, the foundation of a bilateral relationship between China and Nauru. So how will Nauru implement that principle in future exchanges? When we, uh, as our cabinet, decided to take this step, we actually uh, did something uh, quite different as well in going about it. We took the decision to the parliament of Nauru, where, interestingly, we received unanimous support. I don't know if this has been uh, replicated in other countries, but this is, for us, I think, an historical moment for such a major uh, political decision to be made and uh, unanimously agreed to by all members of the Parliament of Nauru. I think it speaks uh, volumes about our uh, Nauru leadership and particularly in uh, moving forward in promoting our bilateral relations. And we believe we will be on the right side of history by recognizing the One China Principle and holding dear to it. We hope to further promote that in all our relations with other countries, but particularly in pursuing our foreign policy. Right, and this March you made your first uh, state visit to China, held talks with President Xi Jinping, and you both witnessed uh, the signing of a cooperation agreement, including Belt Road Initiative. So what can you share with us on the progress of these uh, cooperation deals. Yes, it's uh, early days now, but um, we are about to commence on major transformational uh, projects in Nauru uh, regarding education, but particularly also in sports. Uh, I think we will start to see the results uh, very soon uh, in line with um, President Xi Jinping's intentions to see early harvests in the bilateral relationship. Well, with all that being said, what changes do you expect Belt and Road cooperation, especially, uh, to bring to Nauru? We expect a transformational change in Nauru. The size of China, its uh, technological prowess and its capacity to provide uh, significant and modern uh, development uh, assistance to Nauru can so easily turn Nauru into what uh, development and progress should be in a small Pacific Island nation. Right, and development is, of course, uh, the priority to solving the problems of the most developing countries. And uh, China's uh, Global Development Initiative calls for staying committed to development that is uh, people-centered, mutually beneficial for all, and uh, innovation-driven, harmoniously coexisting with nature, and results-oriented, etc. So what are Nauru's priorities for development, and how does this uh, Global Development Initiative align with Nauru's development Needs. We see a uh, great promise in transforming our education, our schools for our children, the public health, and of course, um, curative health as well, uh, but particularly also in sports, using sports as a platform to promote um, health for the people and particularly for the children of Nauru. And that was the president of Nauru talking about uh, his country's relations and cooperation with China. Uh, Papua New Guinea was uh, one of the first Pacific nations to establish diplomatic relations with China and sign an MOU under the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, Gabriel Bego from National Broadcaster NBC PNG uh, shares his views on the expanding bilateral cooperation. There's been a lot of cooperation uh, between both countries in the areas of political trade and investments and people-to-people relationships. One of these uh, major projects is the uh, government project on the Connect PNG, where we see cooperation in the area of infrastructure development that's uh, connecting, linking rural villages, rural places through uh, this Connect PNG program. And that uh, program has been one of the flagship programs of the country. Uh, Papua New Guineans they see China as uh, a friend and a development partner. They see because of the uh, investments, some of the you know, Chinese companies invest in Papua New Guinea and also Papua New Guinean businesses are exporting uh, their products to China. 
And that was Gabriel Bego from the National Broadcasting Corporation in Papua New Guinea talking about the country's cooperation with China. Coming up, heavy rains and widespread flooding in northeast China. Ever wondered what's actually going on in Africa through the perspective of an African? How are things really going between China and Africa? What's the narrative of this relationship? Well, get a perspective with China Africa Talk. Hear from African diplomats, entrepreneurs, academics, Chinese natives, and more. Get on our wavelength every week to find out what's real with China Africa Talk. Find us on your favorite podcast. We'll see you there. 25 minutes past the hour, rescue efforts are underway in a northeast Chinese city following widespread flooding. The rain-triggered floodings killed 11 people in Huludao, Liaoning province. Another 14 are missing. The hardest-hit parts of the city experienced a year's worth of rain in half a day. It was the strongest rainfall event in Huludao since meteorological records began in 1951. Rescue teams helped farmers transfer crops and fruits from the fields. A risk identification and reconstruction Construction work have started to ensure students are returning to school on time after summer holidays. Meanwhile, authorities have sent experts and medical uh, uh, equipment to the hardest hit places to disinfect all of the affected areas. Officials have also relocated over 50,000 residents to safe areas. Wang Nai Chan visits a relocation site and has more details. This middle school in Heishanke Township has been transformed into a temporary relocation site for those displaced by the severe floods. Located in one of the hardest hit areas, the school offers critical shelter for nearly 100 people, along with medical care and essential supplies. All villagers in our township who needed a relocation have been moved to this site. We have emergency fire trucks, ambulances, and support from the Red Cross, ensuring that everyone receives the three meals a day. Medical staffs are on standby to provide immediate treatment if anyone has health issues. The busy spot on the site is undoubtedly the area near the food truck. Every meal time draws villagers together for a chat and a warm meal. The shared space fosters a sense of community and support among those affected by the disaster. We brought a mobile kitchen that can serve 300 people at every meal. Today's menu includes chicken legs with potatoes and spicy pork. Many of the volunteers you see here are local villagers who have joined us, helping with cooking, distributing food, and maintaining order. The devastating floods not only destroy the homes that many rely on for their livelihoods, they've also had a profound psychological impact. I still recall the night of August 17th when it rained heavily and didn't stop until 7 a.m. the next morning. A large amount of water entered my home, rising almost up to my neck. Thankfully, we survived. After the disaster, we were relocated here, and the care we've received has been beyond words. It's getting dark here at the relocation site, but you can still see different departments hard at work. Medical personnel remain standby and Red Cross volunteers are preparing meals for tomorrow. All these efforts are focused on ensuring safety and livelihood of those affected by the disaster. And that was Wang Naichan reporting. At 28 past the hour, Beijing's down to 20 degrees overnight, a light, uh, light rainfall Monday evening. Uh, Tuesday will be sunny and 30. Nanchang's down to 28, then cloudy and 36. Elsewhere in Asia, Islamabad's 22 this evening. Tuesday has a slight rainfall and 30. Bintian's down to 25 degrees, followed by a slight rain and 32. Phnom Penh's at 25 overnight, then a slight rain and 32 degrees. In Africa, Nairobi's getting a slight rain with a high of 25 on Tuesday. Kampala's down to 20, then a slight rain and 26. Juba's 21 this evening, then some rainfall and 29. And finally to Oceania, Port Vila's 23 this evening, then a slight rain and 28. Nepal will get a slight rain Tuesday, the high of 28 degrees Celsius. It's time for a short break. So far this hour, Hamas says it's rejected new Israeli conditions in the latest Gaza ceasefire talks. Leaders from 18 Pacific Island nations are gathering in Tonga for the annual meeting of the Pacific Islands Forum. And rescue efforts are underway in flood-affected regions of northeast China after the latest heavy rainfall. Shane Begum with you. Stay with us here on the Beijing Hour. Home. I love you, Betty. Love. Remember? Thank 
Thank you. Bing an, bing bing an an. Fate. Take care. Take care. Tua, me tua. What do they truly mean? Nasha, where did you go? Nasha, Nasha! Embark on a century-long journey with CGTN Radio's latest offering. Echoes of Kulian, a gripping audio drama series inspired by real-life tales. Has anyone heard of a Kodasha? From unexpected encounters to heartfelt reunions, immerse yourself in a narrative of love, peace, and enduring friendship. He's a piece of my lost childhood. Listen to Echoes of Kulian on radio.cgtn.com and all major podcast platforms. Being on. Bing, Bing An, Bing An. The best military commander is not he who fights a hundred battles and wins every one of them. The best military strategy does not lead to the desiccation of the enemy's capital city. Decoding the art of war will help you understand why there's no art in war and how Sun Tzu stayed undefeatable using the science of war, with fun stories and insightful breakdown of famous battles. Find Decoding the Art of War wherever you listen. Examining the events that impact and shape China and the rest of the world. This is the Beijing Hour, one hour of news and information brought to you every weekday. Now here's your host. Shane Bigham with you on this Monday. Still to come. In business, China opposes a U.S. decision on export controls. In sports, Chinese swimmer Sun Young takes gold upon his return to the pool. In culture and entertainment, China's summer box office has raked in 11 billion yuan so far. To contact us, you can email radio at cgtn.com or follow our X account, formerly Twitter, at CGTN Radio. But now check in the day's headline news. The Chinese Coast Guard's taken lawful control measures against two Philippine Coast Guard vessels. The vessels entered waters near Xianbinjiao Reef in China's Nancha Islands without Beijing's authorization. China says the Philippine ships engaged in dangerous maneuvers, approaching Chinese Coast Guard vessels operating in the area and escalating the situation. China's seen over 800 million railway passenger trips since July 1st, and the figure marks an increase of 6.2% from the same period last year. The average daily number of railway passenger trips reached over 14 million during the period. Rescue efforts are underway in a northeast Chinese city following widespread flooding. The rain-triggered floodings killed 11 people in Huludao, Liaoning province, and another 14 are missing. The hardest-hit parts of the city experienced a year's worth of rain in only half a day. It was the strongest rainfall event in Huludao since meteorological records began in 1951. Our rescue teams helped farmers transfer crops and fruits from the fields. Hamas says it's rejected new Israeli conditions put forward in Gaza ceasefire talks. Hamas on Sunday urged Israel to abide by July's ceasefire proposal, which included a permanent ceasefire and Israel's complete withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. Uh, these were among the terms stated in the UN Security Council resolution and a speech by U.S. President Joe Biden. Hamas negotiators left Cairo after meeting uh, mediators from Egypt and Qatar. Several major European airlines have suspended flights to and from Israel and Lebanon due to escalating hostilities between the countries. European governments have urged their citizens to leave Lebanon. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah announced that the militant attack has ended and people can return home in Lebanon. If the result is not sufficient, in our opinion, we will reserve the right to respond at another time. Let the people relax. Whoever wants to go back home can go back home. Earlier, Israeli and Hezbollah forces exchanged fire along the border. Israel launched airstrikes in what it called a preemptive move against a potential Hezbollah rocket attack. Both sides have now halted the heavy fire, signaling no immediate further escalation. UN Special Envoy for Libya has highlighted the importance of the 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission in maintaining the ceasefire in Libya. Uh, Stephanie Khoury was speaking during a visit to CERT around 450 kilometers east of Tripoli. Khoury stressed the need to uphold the 2020 UN-sponsored ceasefire agreement, which ended conflict between rival factions in the country. The 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission is a group composed of representatives from the Tripoli-based Government of National Unity and the Eastern-based National Army. 
Leaders of Pacific Island nations are gathering in Tonga for the uh, annual meeting. The Prime Minister of Tonga chairs the five-day Pacific Islands Forum, which kicks off on Monday. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has praised the 18 member states for their efforts to protect the seas and combat climate change. The Pacific Islands Forum is guided by the long-term 2050 strategy to ensure the health and well-being of the people. Militants have killed 23 passengers in an attack on a highway in southwest Pakistan. The attack occurred in Balochistan province. Officials say the gunmen forced passengers out of their vehicles and checked their uh, ethnicities before shooting those from Punjab province. The attackers burned at least 10 vehicles before fleeing the scene. There uh, was no immediate claim of responsibility. The Pakistani uh, Interior Ministry called the attack barbaric and vowed to hold the attackers accountable. Wildfires in Brazil's Sao Paulo state have killed at least two people. Authorities have declared a state of emergency in 45 cities. And federal police are investigating the causes of the fires. Authorities have arrested two people on suspicion of setting fires. Authorities say they've recorded 4,700 fire outbreaks this month. Experts say recent droughts have increased the risk of fire in woods surrounding cities. German police have reported that a 26-year-old man turned himself in, claiming responsibility for the deadly knife attack in Solingen that left three people dead and eight wounded. The statement has greatly relieved local residents. That's reassuring, of course. I think it's very good that the person has either turned themselves in or at least been arrested. And it was perhaps really interesting. Why? This question of why does something like this happen? Of course, he's reassuring that he's supposedly turned it himself in now. But I'm speechless and totally shocked. Uh, the attack occurred during a festival celebrating the city's 650th anniversary. And local police are now conducting an intensive investigation. This is Shane Begum in the Chinese capital. Coming up in business, China opposes a U.S. decision on export controls. The Beijing Hour, your window on China and the rest of the world. 36 past the hour. In business, stock markets on the Chinese mainland closed higher on Monday. The Shanghai Composite was slightly above flat. The Shenzhen Component Index gained nearly two-tenths of a percent. Now, shares of energy metals and wind power equipment led the gainers. Timothy Pope has more. Chinese mainland stock markets remain pretty much range bound. Uh, in fact, for more than a week, the moves on the Shanghai Composite Index have been pretty narrow up and down. The index barely moved at all by the close. Uh, it's been a similar story in Shenzhen as well. There just hasn't been much to enthuse investors uh, and lure them back from other investment avenues. Lately, of course, uh, there's just been much more attention on the bond market and uh, other products. Uh, deemed as being uh, safer havens. The PBOC staged another cash injection. It's kept uh, the medium term and short term uh, lending rates to financial institutions. The, uh, the MLF and the seven day uh, repo rate, both of those unchanged. And uh, given that, there's, uh, there's been no, no cuts to those. Now the market will be, uh, will be watching for any cuts in the amount of cash that banks need to keep in reserve, the so-called triple R, the reserve requirement ratio. And that was Timothy Pope reporting. The Hong Kong stock market ended higher. The Hang Seng Index uh, increased more than 1%. In Japan, uh, the Nikkei lost almost 7 tenths of a percent. China has expressed opposition to the U.S. decision to add several Chinese entities to its export control list. The U.S. made the decision citing China's ties with Russia. A spokesperson from the Chinese Commerce Ministry says the move amounts to unilateral sanctions and long-arm jurisdiction. The spokesperson also says the action disrupts international trade and threatens global supply chain capabilities. Uh, China is urging the U.S. to stop these actions immediately and has warned that it'll take steps to protect the rights of its companies. A Chinese trade expert says the U.S. decision to add those Chinese entities to its export control list will disrupt cooperation across the industrial chain. Senior Research Fellow Joe Mi from the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation says uh, the U.S. export controls will impact not only Chinese enterprises, but also the broader international trade order. We know that they haven't proved, uh, giving a lot of proofs or evidence about what the accused Chinese companies is doing. And actually, the, the lack of uh, transparency has made it a very artific- 
arbitrarily and subjective by the U.S. side. So it is a very important interference with the expectation of the market when they are going to do the business. They should not try to think it's in a longer term. And the companies need to consider about the consequences of this export control mechanism. And when they are doing business with Chinese companies, which is one of the most important parts in the world, they are suffering from the uncertainties. The latest entities added to the export control list are primarily distributors of electronic components within the chip and semiconductor supply chain. Uh, Joe added that one reason for the U.S. imposing these controls is to protect its competitive advantages for various strategic reasons. Data from the Chinese Finance Ministry shows a fiscal revenue decline of 2.6% in the first seven months, improving from the 2.8% decline in the first half of the year. The national general public budget revenue topped 13.5 trillion yuan, or 1.9 trillion U.S. dollars. Stripping out impacts such as tax refund schemes, uh, the fiscal revenue could have reported 1.2% growth. Local government revenue reached almost 7.6 trillion yuan, registering growth of 0.6%. Many international financial institutions have expressed confidence in China's continued economic rebound and rising industrial demand. Research by Swiss banking giant UBS shows that the recovery trends in the country's industries will benefit corporate profits. Research from American multinational Fidelity shows that the world's second largest economy is gaining positive outcomes from its national policies aimed at stabilizing the economy. The manufacturing sector is also showing the most significant improvement. Deputy General Manager Guo Peng of J.P. Morgan Asset Management China says they'll in, uh, increase investment in areas related to new quality productive forces. We have long been bullish on China's quality assets and the stability of economic development. We have also submitted applications for products related to grain bonds taking advantage of our globalization to make grain finance better serve the real economy. Investment from Neuberger Berman Group has also found that China's production and demand are steadily rebounding thanks to the country's uh, ongoing implementation of pro-growth policies. Promoting better employment opportunities for Tibetans has long been one of the key focuses of China's national aid program for Shizong Autonomous Region. Local authorities in Chongqing, in cooperation with enterprises, have been uh, making efforts to help many young people from Shizong find employment in the southwestern municipality while contributing to talent development for Shizong's future growth. Uh, Gong Ming has details. Luo Song Zhuoge from Changdu, Xijiang Autonomous Region, currently works as a data annotator at a tech company in Chongqing that provides artificial intelligence data services. Initially unfamiliar with the field, she has become proficient in data processing and now serves as a team leader. After graduation, I found out about the job opportunities through our local government's human resources department. I joined a skills training program organized by this company in Chongqing and ended up staying here to work. Besides the financial support, I've also had many opportunities to grow. In coordination with relevant departments in Xizhuang's Chengdu and the Chongqing Aid Xizhuang work team, The company has provided professional skills training to over 200 Tibetan college graduates. Currently, the company employs 27 graduates from Chengdu. To help them integrate better into the team, the company frequently organizes team-building activities and targeted business training. The company will provide language training for Tibetan youth to improve communication with other employees. We're also focused on preparing them for training and management positions. More graduates from Xizhang will be joining us soon, which will make the training even more effective since they all share the same language and culture. Dawa, another employee from Chengdu who has worked here for over a year, has been recognized as an outstanding employee for the last quarter due to his excellent professional skills and meticulous work attitude in handling artificial intelligence data audits. To nurture talent, the company has also started assigning Dawa more responsibilities. At first, I wasn't really used to the work environment, but the experienced folks at the company helped us get familiar with the projects quickly. Now, when new people join, we also help train them so they can adjust faster. 
The Employment Service Center jointly established by Chongqing and Chengdu plans to expand cooperation with more companies to provide additional job opportunities. The regular conduct video follow-ups with Tibetan youth employed in Chongqing, offering job consultations, information updates, and psychological support. The center also organizes family visits for Tibetans and other events to strengthen ties between the two regions. By organizing relevant activities, we've helped college graduates from Xi'an broaden their vision about job opportunities. We've also ramped up recruitment efforts, ensuring that companies and candidates are better matched, allowing us to pinpoint the right talent for the right roles. So far, more than 5,400 people from Chengdu have secured employment and insurance in Chongqing. Working in Chongqing has broadened the horizons of many young people from Xinjiang, giving them greater expectations for the future. That was Gongming reporting. Uh, the 19th China Commodities Fair in Kazakhstan attracted significant attention from government authorities and enter- or rather entrepreneurs alike. Uh, the exhibition featured a wide range of products across various categories, including food, apparel, electronics, and agricultural equipment. Over 230 companies from Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, Shanxi, Gansu, and other Chinese provinces have participated in the event. Uh, Kazakh uh, Trade and Integration Vice Minister Kairat Turbayev speaks highly of the exhibition. We know that the exhibition is a real and effective tool for promoting products in international markets. It provides a unique opportunity not only to showcase your products, but also to establish direct contacts with potential partners, study new market trends, and strengthen your brand. Well, Kazakhstan set up a national pavilion for the first time this year. More than a dozen Kazakh companies presented semi-finished products, oils, wines, and dairy products. You're listening to the Beijing Hour. Coming up in sports, Chinese swimmer Sun Young takes gold upon his return to the pool. Sideline Story brings you all things sports-related. The hottest topics, latest events, juiciest stories, all with a very personal take. Subscribe to Sideline Story Podcast for heated sports discussions covering events that are happening in China and around the world. Uh, 47 past now. And turning to sports, here's Yang Guang. Thank you, Shane. Chinese swimmer Sun Yan has claimed the gold in the men's 400-meter freestyle at the 2024 National Summer Swimming Championships. It came after a four-year and three-month suspension for an anti-doping rule violation. Sun burst into tears after winning the gold and says he hopes to have a better performance next year. I The goal set by my coach before the competition was to finish within four minutes because it had been four years since I last competed. So it is not easy for me to control the pace. It makes me emotional thinking about having this opportunity to return to competition after four years and being able to top the podium at such a good venue. I think it is the best reward for me as the efforts I made over the past four years are finally paying off. And I want to thank my family, especially my parents. Sun became China's first men swimming Olympic champion at London 2012, where he won in 400m and 1500m freestyle. At Rail 2016, Sun won the men's 200m freestyle to become the first male swimmer to collect Olympic golds in 200m, 400m and 1500m freestyle. In 2021, a panel of the Court of Arbitration for Sport announced that Sun Yang committed anti-doping rule violations when an unsuccessful attempt was made to collect blood and urine samples from him at his residence. The National Summer Swimming Championships is a Class B national swimming event in China, second only to the National Swimming Championships. Chinese esports club Edward Gaming has secured the Valorant Champions 2024 trophy in Seoul, South Korea. The win marks China's inaugural international triumph in a shooting esports game. Sniper Cheng Yangkang was the MVP of the grand final. He and his teammates will share a prize money of 1 million US dollars. Female wheelchair fencing athlete Gu Haiyan and the male weightlifter Qi Yong Kai will be the flag bearers for China at the opening ceremony of the Paris Paralympics. Gu won the gold medal in the women's individual foil event and the team foil event at the Tokyo Paralympics. 
She has claimed the title in the men's 59 kilogram weightlifting category. The Paris Paralympic Games will kick off on Wednesday. This will be China's 11th participation in the Summer Paralympics. Armand Duplantis has broken his pole vault world record at the Silesia Diamond League, clearing 6.26 meters on his second attempt. It was less than a month after setting the record in Paris. Duplantis has now broken the men's pole vault record for a tenth time. He first set the record in 2020 when he cleared 6.17 meters, and one year later he took the gold at the Tokyo Olympics. Turning to football, Real Madrid has secured a 3-0 win over Real Valladolid in La Liga. Madrid broke the deadlock in the 50th minute when Federico Valverde scored from a free kick. Substitute Brian Diaz made it 2-0 in the 88th minute. Andrik Felipe replaced Kylian Mbappe late in the match and scored deep into stoppage time to seal the victory. Manager Carlo Ancelotti says Mbappe still needs time to prove himself. He's a forward. He's a spectacular forward. He has great speed. He moves very well without the ball. He attacks the spaces. He had three, four chances. He created those with his movements. I think he's going to score. I don't think it's about playing on the left or playing the middle. He's going to generate, and he's going to score goals. It was a first league win for the defending champions after they opened with a one-all draw at Mallorca last weekend. McLaren driver Lando Norris has produced a dominant performance to win the Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort. The Brit ended Max Verstappen's run of wins at home, crossing the line ahead of the Red Bull Racing driver, while Charles Leclerc was third. Norris says his car felt incredible and he had a lot of confidence during the race. We've had a very good surprise, but we need to understand why. And, and in order f- to reproduce these kind of performances more often, and I, I don't quite have the explanation of our uh, really good performance. And that's not only me, but that's Carlos and myself. So there was clearly something in the car that made us do a step forward. Verstappen is on top of the driver standings with 295 points. Norris has 225, while Leclerc is third with 192. Chinese driver Zhou Guanyu ended 20th for Kick Sauber. The 16th round of the World Championship is next weekend's Italian Grand Prix at Monza. Karen Wilson came from a seven to eight down to overturn Judd Trump 10-8, winning his seventh World Snooker Ranking title at the Xi'an Grand Prix. Before the session, Wilson took a 5-4 lead against Trump. Trump and Wilson traded wins in the 10th and 11th frames. Before Trump won two frames to go up 7-6 before the last intermission. However, Wilson won three frames in a row and claimed the title. And finally, a baseball shirt won by one of the great game's greatest players has sold in the U.S. for a record-breaking 24.1 million U.S. dollars. Babe Ruth won the New York Yankees jersey when he hit a home run to help his team win the 1932 World Series. Ruth was elected to the Sports Hall of Fame in 1936 as one of its first five inaugural members. Ruth kept the jersey before giving it to a friend, whose daughter eventually sold it for a six-figure sum in the 1990s. It sold again in the ad auction in 2005 for 940,000 U.S. dollars. All right, thank you very much. That was Yang Guang with sports. Coming up in culture and entertainment, China's summer box office has raked in 11 billion yuan so far. Discover the realities and responses to our changing climate with Climate Watch. Uncover critical issues such as the Masai Mara's disrupted wildebeest migration and the drop in the Panama Canal's water levels. Delve into solutions for a sustainable future. Tune in to Climate Watch on your favorite podcast platform. Become more eco-conscious and take action to protect our planet. We're at 53 minutes past the hour. Turning to culture and entertainment now,、uh, China's box office revenue for the summer movie season has so far surpassed 11 billion, or around 1.5 billion U.S. dollars. The top five films in the current box office rankings are Successor, A Place Called Silence, Moments We Shared, Alien Romulus, and Deadpool and Wolverine.、Uh, the summer movie season in China begins on June 1st, and it lasts until the end of this month.
Inside Out 2 has become the first ever animated movie to gross over 1 billion US dollars at the international box office. It overtook Frozen 2, which had been the record holder since 2019. Uh, the film is one of just 12 to ever cross the 1 billion threshold. Other films include Avatar, Titanic, Avengers Endgame, and Star Wars The Force Awakens. Uh, Jingdezhen in Jiangxi is renowned for its ceramics history of over 2,000 years. The eastern Chinese city is experiencing a renewal now and has drawn more international artists in recent years. Uh, Guo Meiping has this story. Jingdezhen is renowned for its ceramic history dating back over 2,000 years. The city is experiencing a renewal, and more international artists have come here in recent years. The international artists are called Yang Jingpiao meaning migrants from abroad. They came to start businesses and feel inspired in the city through kilns and fire. Jelma Ribelta is a ceramic artist from Spain. He became a Yang Jingpiao in 2022. Here I get to deep in into more, not just Chinese culture, but ceramic technology, the way how it's been working here in China also. The great success of China Chen is because accepts and welcomes any idea, any opinion to coming in. Ribelta has set up his studio in Jingdezhen with help from the local network of artists. There is a very special web here of ceramic artists, institutions, private companies that understand very well what it means uh, for newcomers to come here and trying to settle. I think Jingdezhen is very friendly in this way. I received lots of help from everyone. I'm really grateful for that. The Tao Xichuan Ceramic Art Avenue is a new landmark of Jingdezhen, renovated from an old factory. An international studio is set up here to help foreign artists with their artistic careers. Since its establishment in 2015, the international studio has collaborated with 3,600 international artists from 56 countries. The living facilities within the Art Avenue are well laid out fully meeting the needs of ceramic art, from material preparation to final king firing. My favorite thing, obviously, is this, uh, this uh, ceramic world. And uh, there is so many manufacturers, so many artists, so, many, so much craft. Uh, it's all over the place. And I already met uh, a lot of people. And I enjoy all the discussions about art and ceramics. The studio has arranged various activities for foreign artists, including exhibitions, lectures, forums, and workshops. And that was Guo Meiping reporting. Chinese video game Black Myth Wukong has become a massive hit globally and is now taking the U.S. market by storm. U.S. gamer Tyler Cole piloted the cultural story as background information. Big franchises like, you know, Marvel and Call of Duty, right? But you rarely get kind of action games that aren't an established series, just being something so unique and new. You fight like a, a bunch of wolf enemies that are that have like staffs and stuff and you can go into a journal at any point in time and read like a basically just like a short story or something, basically like a parable. So there's tons of opportunities to just learn about just all these different characters from the original story. Goldman Sachs previously projected that Black Myth Wukong could achieve sales of 12 million copies on Steam, generating over 3 billion yuan or 420 million US dollars in revenue. In a bullish scenario, the game could reach 20 million units, uh, with revenue topping 5 billion yuan. The Broadway musical Chicago is coming to China in October. Its production companies announced plans to tour 11 cities in China and perform 74 shows. The cities include Shenzhen, Zhengzhou, Foshan, and Beijing. Sarah Soter will play Roxy Hart, and Michelle Entrobus will play Velma Kelly in the China tour. Chicago has a nearly 50-year history since it debuted on Broadway in 1975, and it's won a slew of significant awards in performing arts. At 58 past the hour, Beijing's down to 20 with a light rainfall on Monday evening. Tuesday will be sunny, the high is 30. Nanchung's at 28 overnight, then cloudy in 36. Elsewhere in Asia, Islamabad's down to 22 degrees this evening, a slight rainfall in 30 on Tuesday. Vientiane's down to 25 degrees, a slight rain in 32 tomorrow. Phnom Penh's 25 overnight, then some rain in 32. In Africa, Nairobi is getting a slight rain and 25 degrees on Tuesday. Kampala's down to 20, then a slight rain and 
26 degrees. And that's it for this edition of the Beijing Hour. Making news today, Hamas says it's rejected new Israeli conditions on the latest uh, uh, Gaza ceasefire talks, and leaders of 18 Pacific Island nations have gathered in Tonga for meetings. On behalf of the staff, this is Shane Bigham in the Chinese capital, hoping you'll join us for the next edition of the Beijing Hour and open a window to the world together. Take Away Chinese, where you can take some Chinese away and experience progress day by day. Take Away Chinese, we will promise you a difference. Hello everybody, welcome to Roundtable, coming to you live from Beijing. From Beijing. Roundtable. 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 Connecting China and the world. We bring you fun and timely discussions about what's affecting our lives everywhere, every day. Tune in to Roundtable, where the East meets the West and understanding is the goal. From North to South, East to West, people in China are chasing their dreams and leaving their mark. Want to know how they beat the odds and made a difference? Footprints brings you the true life stories of their journeys. 